during this session. Uh, so welcome. Uh, first, some housekeeping notes uh, to stick to the GDPR. Uh, as attendees, you cannot see the list of other attendees. So, so just please feel free to use the chat to say hi and also the Discord channel. And uh, you can find the link to the Discord channel in the chat posted by Alina. In this session, we will have three presentations and we will hear and see three different insights to data harmonizations. For questions, uh, uh, we will be using the Q&A box uh, in, in the bottom row of your screen. Uh, you can also raise your hand if, if you want to ask the question in person and I, I will then unmute you. Uh, we will have time for a couple of questions after each, each presentation and there's time for more questions or discussion after all the three presentations. Uh, I, I would just like to remind you that the session will be recorded uh, and then if you are asking a question and don't want to appear, uh, you can just turn off your camera. Uh, so without further ado, I, I would like to start with our first presentation. Uh, this is a cross study variable concordance with DDI lifecycle and it will be presented by Jeremy Iverson. So many of you already know Jeremy. Uh, he is a co-founder and partner at Collectica where he helps build software to document statistical data using open standards. Previously, he was a programmer at the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study working to process, document and disseminate data for the long running study. Uh, Jeremy is currently an invited expert on the Data Docu Documentation Initiatives or DDI's uh, Technical Committee. Uh, so, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, Jeremy, you can share your screen. Sure. All right. Does that come through? Yes, yes, okay. looks good. All right, uh, it wants to use my other screen to go full screen. So I'll just keep it like this. I don't have any animations or anything, so that should be fine. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining uh, this afternoon or this morning for me, I'm in Minneapolis. Um, oh yeah, so I'm gonna talk about doing cross study variable concordance, uh, talking a little bit about a pilot project out of uh, ICPSR and also what are the DDI metadata structures that we're using to perform this sort of concordance. Uh, to start off, I just want to give a brief intro about Collectica so you have some background for those of us who aren't familiar uh, with our company or the software. Uh, so basically what we try to do with our software is to create tools for doing standards-based data documentation and DDI of course is the big standard for this that we use. Uh, users of Collectica and of DDI fall into a few groups, mainly national stats organizations, uh, research data organizations out of universities often, and data archives. And these sorts of organizations use our software to catalog repeated data and to document it in great detail uh, with the ultimate goal of publishing web portals or code books or data dictionaries. And so what we're really trying to do is let researchers discover data across data sets, let them understand the data and where it came from, uh, and then allow this data ultimately to be used more widely and cited more widely. So for the talk today, I want to talk a little bit about the history of doing variable concordance within a single study. Um, that's been going on for a long time now using DDI and otherwise. Um, and then I want to talk about the structures used for that and then kind of expand upon those structures to uh, you know, how can we do this sort of concordance across studies, not just within a single study. I'll talk about the process that ICPSR used for declaring the concordance across multiple studies for that pilot project. And then we'll also take a look at a few different um, studies that are showing this sort of concordance on the web. So yeah, to start with the single study, um, people have been doing this, I shouldn't really say since 2014, because it's probably been going on for decades before that even. Uh, 2014 is when DEI Lifecycle 3.2 came out and where these studies that we were familiar with were using DDI Lifecycle to document variable concordance within their individual studies. Uh, but I know Mari mentioned I worked at 
WLS, um, and that would have been in like 2003 or something. And they had some handmade concordance tables on the web since before I was there. So all the way back to 2000 or possibly before that even. So this idea of saying what variables are measuring the same thing in different waves of a study, that's been around a long time. I think being able to do it in a structured way with a standard has been a bit newer. So 2014 with DDI 3.2. Um, and then more recently, I think with cross study stuff that we'll take a look at. So just to kind of give an idea of the sorts of concordance I'm thinking of here, go to this window. So looking at midlife in the United States, MIDAS uh, is a longitudinal study since the 90s. They have three main rounds plus a couple of other rounds with different samples. And so looking at concordance within a single study here, MIDAS, we can kind of drill by topic, say we care about caregiving, or living arrangements, and we'll see that, you know, have you ever lived in an institution? We've got that measured in looks like seven different waves. Whether you've been in a boarding school is measured in six different waves, and they've been able to concord all these variables from the individual data sets um, to say that they're measuring the same thing over time. And you can get the details across time by popping it up. Um, so they've been doing this a long time with DDI Lifecycle 3.2. Uh, other studies have done similar things, so like NHAT, which is out of Johns Hopkins. Um, they go straight to their concordance and very similar look and feel, same metadata structures used underneath, and they're just saying, what are the variables in this round two data set that measure uh, the year a person died, for example? So we've got links to some of those just to show, you know, what are we talking about when we do, when we talk about concordance? Um, since this is a DDI conference, I thought it might be nice to look at the actual metadata structure that we're using to document this sort of concordance in a standard way. And so some very brief background on some of the terms we'll use. So variable, what is that? Very simple. Uh, a variable is a column in a data set. So in this very simple Excel data set, you'd have four variables, um, name, height, birth date, marital status. You could also view that in a table like this and see some of the data. Um, each of those columns has a type, so text or numbers or dates or codes, which are one of the big ones, of course. Uh, this coded data type, you know, M is going to mean something like married, S is going to mean something like single in the case of a marital status. And so we've got a code list and a variable. And these, of course, are all DDI item types that you can uh, describe in DDI. So if we're talking about concordance in a single study, let's say, we might have three similar data sets, um, similar columns perhaps, different data for different respondents or the same respondents at different points in time perhaps, uh, and they might measure the same stuff. So in this case, they're all measuring the same four things, it looks like. Uh, but we'll notice one change in the marital status, which is in this third data set, we've got a new code that wasn't in the first two data sets. So the code list has changed. So in DDI, what we would do is create a new code list or perhaps just a new version of the code list that adds that new code, D for divorced. And the variable that now uses this expanded code set is going to reference this new code list. Well, the two earlier variables are still just going to reference the old code list because they haven't changed at all. So to declare the concordance of these three variables, these three different columns of data, uh, which could be in the same data set or different data sets, that doesn't matter. Uh, to declare the concordance here, we'd use a metadata structure like this. So we've already seen the variables. Sometimes we'll call those instance variables, and those are describing the actual columns in the actual data sets. So since there's two different ways of representing this variable, one with just the married and single codes and one with that third code for divorced, there's going to be two represented variables. So that's another DDI item type that says, what are we measuring and how are we measuring it? So what's the code list in this case? And then since we're really just measuring one thing, even though we're measuring it in different ways, there's just a single conceptual variable. And that's just saying, what are we measuring? About whom, perhaps? So we're measuring marital status about humans in this case. So we've got this three-level structure. Oftentimes, we'll call it the variable cascade. And so the conceptual variable is the most generic. You're just saying, what are we measuring? The represented variable is saying, what are we measuring by referencing the conceptual variable and how? So what specific code list or what numeric data type are we using? 
And then the instance variables just reference a represented variable to say, how are we represented? And then go one more step to find out what are we measuring generically? So it seems like a lot of metadata items perhaps, but there's benefits to doing it this way. So one is that it allows comparison across data sets. Uh, another big one is that it's not relying on variable names or naming conventions to detect um, comparability because as hard as any study might try to keep the convention consistent, it's very difficult over time. Um, and so instead in DDI, you get to use these underlying unique identifiers to create these relationships more explicitly than just saying, well, it's named the same or it's named the same with some numbers at the end, so it must be the same. So it's much more explicit in that sense. Uh, and that lets us create reports to show how things change over time. And it also helps you plan for future data collection or future data set production. Um, you know, for example, if you can picture, maybe you have a set of these represented variables, you could just take that set of represented variables and say, let's create a data set that has instance variables for every one of these. Um, of course, you have to get the data there, but that would let you create a totally comparable data set, at least in the sense of data types and, and what you're measuring. All right, so that's all for a single study. So now let's get into doing this across studies. So oftentimes, and in, in the case of this ICPSR pilot that I mentioned, uh, separate studies will have already done this concordance individually. And so we don't wanna have to redo everything and redo the concordance for two big studies, right? So instead, the approach we're taking is to create a new common set of conceptual variables and actually allow declaring different conceptual variables to be equivalent to those conceptual variables. In this way, we can perform a concordance uh, without changing the individual studies content. And so that's really good for an organization like ICPSR or any data archive that might want to do this um, because there's no sense in them, you know, redoing the metadata that MIDAS or NHATS or some other study has done. Instead, they can just add to it with this approach. And so the work here for Forming the concordance is just to map each study's conceptual variables to these common conceptual variables that are created. And so the metadata structure ends up looking a bit like this, where we have this new common conceptual variable, call it marital status again. And then we'll have the conceptual variables from each of the studies. So in this example, NHATS has one called marital status and NSHAP has one called MARSTAT. They have different naming conventions, um, but these are both saying we're measuring marital status. And so both of these can be declared to map to this common marital status conceptual variable. And then, you know, going backwards from each study, you've got what we saw before, where within the study, the instance variables and the represented variables are all pointing at the correct place. And so that by doing a single uh, mapping from the conceptual variable to a common conceptual variable, you know, for NSHAP, you're all automatically mapping I think three variables and for n hats, you might be mapping eight or nine different variables um, just by doing the single declaration that the conceptual variable is measuring this other common conceptual variable. Uh, so sometimes it's not a one to one mapping across the studies. So a good example of this is age. So in n hats, for example, they actually measure age in n shap, they measure birth year and birth month. So you can calculate age off of that for any point in time but it takes two variables. And so DDI lifecycle lets you do that kind of many to one mapping. That's just fine. You just say that these two conceptual variables are required to measure this single common conceptual variable. All right, so a little more detail about the NACTA pilot project for this cross study concordance. Um, first we'll talk about the process they used just briefly, and then we'll take a look at the results of that and see what it looks like. So the process they used, I kind of alluded to already. So NHATS had already performed the single study uh, concordance uh, many years ago, I think in, I don't know for sure, but I think 2016 or 2017. Um, so they already had metadata for all their variables and for represented and conceptual variables as well. Uh, NSHAP, which is uh, one of the other, or another study that archives its data with, uh, ICPSR within the aging archive, NACTA at ICPSR, I should say. Um, they had not done this DDI lifecycle variable level um, 
documentation and concordance yet. And so the first step, aside from loading the NHAPS metadata, was to perform that. And so that entailed just ingesting the metadata from, I think, the SBSS files or SAS files, I forget which, um, to get all the variable level metadata for all the different uh, NSHAP data files. And then after that, performing a single study concordance uh, for NSHAP itself. And so once you had these two studies complete individually, the next goal was to create a common set of conceptual variables. And the way the folks at ICPSR did this was to kind of review each of the studies and Hanson and Schapp manually, looking at what content they covered, come up with a topical hierarchy that covered both of them, and then select, I think it was between 100 and 200 variables that they wanted to do this harmonization for or concordance for. And then for each of those 100 or 200 variables, they would go through n hats and say, what's the conceptual variable or multiple conceptual variables used to measure this thing like age or marital status or whatever it was. And they just kind of created a mapping and a spreadsheet to uh, talk about that. And then we ingested that into Collectica, into DDI lifecycle. And that is what created the structure we saw a few slides ago. All right, so the results of that we can take a look at um, is we can take a look first again at the single study concordance and then the cross study concordance. And so the single study with N hats uh, we see here, and this is actually running um, at this site, nhats.collectica.org. Uh, it's a Collectica portal that we host for them, kind of a cloud hosted portal. Um, but you'll also find the same content now at harmonize.icpsr.umich.edu, which is also a Collectica portal um, that Michigan NACTA at ICPSR runs. And so if we start with the explore view, um, we can actually get that same NHATS single study uh, concordance if we want to, exact same content, which is a great thing about having this in a format like DDI lifecycle is that we could just, with a copy operation, move it from one repository to the other to have a copy of it. Um, so same thing we saw a minute ago. Now we can also do that with NSHAP individually. So they have their own topical hierarchy and their own variables and conceptual variables and all of that. Uh, but if we go to explore and then look at the NACTA concepts, so these are those common conceptual variables that I was talking about. Uh, so this is the topical hierarchy they came up with for describing, you know, both studies or I think longer term, many studies would fit into here. And if I click that, we're now going to see both of the NHATS and the NSHAP available in this concordance table. So for something like gender, they both measure it with a single variable. And this little info icon, I can see they're calling it directly comparable. Uh, for something like age, it's going to be one to many. So like I alluded to earlier, uh, NSHAP measures this with a single variable, and NHATS measures it with um, both birth month and birth year. So we still get the visualization showing how um, you know, the two variables from here correspond to the single variable from the other study. Uh, for any of these, again, we can um, pop up details to do some comparisons. Uh, in this case, only N SHAP is providing variable statistics, so we only get summaries from there. N HATS only provides the metadata, but not the uh, descriptives or frequencies. So that's why we don't have more than just the three there. Uh, we have some different views available too. So for two studies, I think it's fine to have this all shown. If you have many studies and you only care about some of them, uh, you can kind of toggle what's shown or not based on what you care about. Um, yeah. So let's see. So yeah, I think the other things I was looking to show, so search we can also do. So search, you can search either at the variable level or the, the conceptual variable level. So if we wanted to search for like age, let's say, get that and just say can we dive into there and this must be the NHATS specific age one we can compare across uh, studies how they're measured this is a pretty boring one since the codes never change but that's a good thing if you're working with this um, sometimes you'll see that that's not the case uh, perhaps if I go back to the the cross study I could find uh, 
like gender, how they compare. So different missing value codes are very apparent right away. Um, very slightly different real codes. So the label is actually one male for uh, N hats and the label is simply lowercase male for N shap. So obviously the same thing, but you know, that's something that a machine may or may not get automatically. So having the humans declare the concordance is pretty useful, especially if the similarities are less similar than that. You could have a machine pick that up probably. All right. So other things you can do with a basket, for example, would be, let's say you want to take data from both studies. Um, you can click plus and have these variables added to your basket. So with a single click, I've got 17 instead of zero items in my basket um, from both NSHAP and NHATS. And if we go to that basket, it's going to separate out the variables in the different studies, um, which is important here, especially because, again, NSHAP does have their data here uh, loaded into the repository at NACTA. And so we could actually download an extract with these three age variables. Uh, whereas NHATS does not have their data in the repository. And so you can download the metadata, your custom code book, but not the, uh, the actual merged data from them. All right. So yeah, that is about what I wanted to cover. So with that, I am happy to take any questions or I forget if we were gonna do that now or at the end, but either way is good. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, we have time for uh, one, two quick questions. Are there any questions? Can't see anything in the Q and A, uh, but you can raise your hand. No, I, I have one and uh, that's about, uh, this is very impressive. I, I'm just wondering uh, what kind of work uh, is needed uh, to, to really get the metadata in there. So is there a lot of scripts or a lot of uh, spreadsheets, Excel uh, worksheets? Uh, that kind of thing going on in the background? Um, so for this pilot project, for example, it was really just one spreadsheet and uh, ingest script on our side that converted that spreadsheet into the DDI metadata. Because um, all the, the file level metadata and the variable level metadata was all, that's easy to bring in just from an SBSS file or SAS or Stata or whatever you have. So doing that individually is straightforward. And then I, maybe I should say two spreadsheets, because if you don't already have the single study concordance done, I think it makes more sense to do the single study concordance first. And so you can have a spreadsheet for that, which looks like just a, um, I can actually, I think, bring up a sample of what it looks like. Let's see how quickly I can uh, remember where this is in our documentation. There we go. So the spreadsheets we ingest look like, oh, no, not there. Look like this. So a name and label for the conceptual variable. So that common thing you're measuring a topic if you want, and they can be nested just by specifying a colon in there. So demographics person is under that. Uh, and then one column for each data set and the variable name is the value of the cell. And so if you can make a spreadsheet like this and you can add some notes to and other columns if you want to, uh, Collectica can bring that in and make the DDI lifecycle um, concordance structure based off of that. And so that's for the single study for the um, multi-study, the spreadsheet looks pretty similar. It's just that instead of the columns for the data sets, you have one column for each uh, study. So one column for NSHAP, one column for NHATS, in the future maybe one column for other uh, studies. And then you have the conceptual variable name instead of the instance variable name in the cells. Um, so yeah, just one or two spreadsheets. Not, I'm not trying to minimize the work that goes into putting the spreadsheets together because that's where the actual you know, intellectual work, the effort lies. Um, but you know, as far as file count, it's pretty low if, as far as what you need. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, uh, we will move to the next presentation, and that will be about DDI Dataverse and Collectica, uh, our data management combo. And the presentation will be done by Alina Dansil. Uh, it's been uh, co-authored by Genevieve Misod.
Uh, so Alina has a sociological background. Uh, she is the team leader of the data sharing team of the Center for Sociopolitical Data of Science 4. And she has been part of the EDI program committee for the last three years. Uh, Genevieve is, is the team leader of the digital projects team at the Sciences Po, and she is in charge of the institutional research data repository. She is also involved in, as project man manager in the SOC project and ESS Sustain 2 project, uh, both are focused on web panel sample services. So without further, the, the floor is yours. And I can see, Alina, you're already sharing your presentation. So please. Thank you, Mari. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Genevieve is not going to speak today. She's the more technical person, but uh, she has some connection issues. So uh, we told ourselves it's more safe if I'm the one doing the talk, but she can answer questions if she's still connecting. And I keep my fingers crossed today that she she is. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about, as you said, Mari, about Dataverse, uh, Collectica, and also I didn't put it in the title at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, Nestar. Uh, so we'll take, take a really quick look. Uh, it's going to be a short presentation on how to go from Nestar to Dataverse uh, for the study level metadata. Uh, also, how to migrate DDI 1.2, it's the DDI from Nestar, to DDI uh, 2.5. And just a quick note on uh, our Collectica using for variable management. Uh, my colleague, Lucie Marie, did a presentation, uh, I had a presentation on this this morning. Uh, so please, I can answer questions, but uh, if you want more, uh, details on this, uh, we'll make the presentation av available, the slides are on Zenodo and uh, the video too, I think. Uh, so just a, uh, a word on Nestar, uh, like many data archives, we used for a long time uh, Nestar uh, for data management. Uh, we manage around 350 data sets at uh, the Center for Social Political Data. And our, as our name says, we mostly manage data, social political data, um, a lot of political surveys, uh, the, French, uh, the French part of the CSES for the most known one. Uh, we, we also have uh, panel studies, but let's say we have a fair share of single studies too, and this is important, uh, and you'll, you'll see why. So at a certain point, uh, once again, as many data archives did, uh, because Nestar, even if it did a great job, uh, Nestar is no longer maintained, and uh, we want it to to be better, to improve. Uh, we decided to um, uh, to give up on Nestar for the time being. We are, we are going to give up to um, in the in the first phase uh, to the Nestar server, uh, but we hope to give up uh, to the Nestar publisher too. Uh, so what happened is that uh, when we first announced this, uh, let's say that both users and data managers were, I wouldn't say they freaked out, but um, nobody was very happy uh, because nobody likes change. And also if you consider the metadata management system a puzzle and you take out a piece of it, uh, it can be a little bit destabilized Realizing uh, for both people and business processes. So you, you let's say you need a backbone. And for us, uh, it was, of course, DDI itself, the standard. Uh, it was a huge part of it. Uh, but what we realized very quickly is that we needed international uh, recommendations. Uh, and this is where the Cessna metadata model comes up. We, we used a lot. Um, we used uh, we used this and it, it helped us a lot uh, because we harmonized uh, our study level metadata. I'll show you the controlled vocabularies we used. Um, so this is where we decided that two uh, other pieces uh, will come into the puzzle 
and namely Dataverse and Collectica. Uh, so once we decided to do this, we had to take out our XM DDI XML files out of Nestar and uh, put it in, into uh, Dataverse. We had to, uh, to do some extra work to do this. We did it in two steps. Uh, first of all, an R script, a, a R script transform the Nestar DDI 1.2 files to DDI uh, 2.5 files, and uh, we integrated the, the controlled vocabularies. And uh, thank you, Alexandre Mero. I don't know if you are here. He's not no longer working with us, but he's doing a presentation in at Eddie. He's still staying in the community. Uh, he's the one. He was the one doing this, and. The second step was a Python custom program. Um, it was made by, by our IT team. Uh, thank you also. Uh, so uh, we imported DDI 2.5 files into Dataverse. And during this step, a persistent identifier, a DOI in our case, was, was given to each study. And then the corresponding DOI, DOI uh, was then inserted back in the DDI 2.5 file. And the DDI 2.5 file is up, was then uploaded into Dataverse. It seems more complicated than it was, I guess. Uh, so here's the list of the CMM controlled vocabularies. Uh, what we had to do uh, for the... Um, uh, we didn't do the translation for the keywords. Uh, it was already done, but we had to um, to do the to make the translation for kind of data time method analysis unit mode, mode collection sampling procedure topic classification and instrument. And uh, it was a, a very good uh, experience. Uh, and I don't think you can see this because my my the bar. Uh, from the button is hiding this, and I don't know how to uh, make it disappear. But we also have uh, one tailored uh, controlled vocabulary uh, that we maintain um, for ourselves for the institution names. Uh, and we used two uh, referentials to do this ROAR and ISNI. And uh, I put um, the links in the in the presentation. So uh, as we are making the presentations available, you can access it, access this if uh, if you're interested. Uh, so some words of the about the benefits of using DataVerse. Uh, we are uh, we at the CDSP are part of the Quetelet Projet de uh, network, uh, which is the French uh, CESDA provider. Uh, so we are working with two other institutions that are uh, sharing data and metadata. So Dataverse is a really good solution for network networked institutions. Uh, some advantages are the single sign-on on using institutional cred credentials. Uh, it can harvest. It can be harvested, and uh, also main uh, huge advantage are the general and dataverse level branding uh, capabilities, and also it supports uh, discoverability and persistence. It has it has a, a powerful uh, search engine. It has filters. Uh, we are really happy about the filters because uh, as we have controlled vocabularies now, we can have a lot of fit filters. So we are really happy about it. Uh, and also we are really happy to have uh, DOIs now. Uh, we have some pending issues with uh, Dataverse uh, because uh, the DDI import and the export uh, are, uh, as my slide says a hard uh, road to follow road to follow uh, we we didn't expect this we were maybe a little naive at the beginning uh, but for for example i am i have a as you said mari a soci sociological background i'm not an it person uh, i cannot import a, an xml file into dataverse without it help at this level uh, so for us, the data managers of the team, it was quite a surprise. We we expect, expected this uh, from Dataverse, uh, and we don't have it, but uh, we are working on it. Uh, and also, as our metadata is in French and the interface or Dataverse is in French, uh, we we quickly. Uh, found out that adding a language creates additional difficulties uh, 
so uh, yeah it can it's it can be not a problem but you may expect to, to to deal with some issues if you want uh to have metadata in, in another language than than english uh so i i some some of the depending issues just to show you an example uh for the topic classification in in the xml files uh the the words are the wording is correct but what you can see here uh is society and culture points social behavior and attitudes uh it's it's not displayed correctly it is displayed correctly uh in the in the filters and it is the information is correct in the xml uh we figured out a solution uh about this with data dataverse and um, it's going to be fixed soon but yeah it's it's something uh we we had to deal with uh and now to the last part uh i mentioned two pieces of the puzzle one 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 was dataverse and dataverse in dataverse we deal with the study level uh, metadata for the time being uh, we also we are we are also testing collective time and we try to let's say integrate it in our uh, toolbox even if for businesses usually we continue to use nestar publisher and we test our scripts uh, we have also been using collectica for a year now for longitudinal studies one of the main questions we have to answer uh, is whether um, we are going to uh, uh, we we have the the resources let's say to use collectica for uh, for single studies uh, we are not sure of uh, of this uh, so what's next uh, improving the main repository uh, data science pool uh, if FR, uh, we are also testing dataverse variable vi visualization tools, and we are setting up uh, a new data management and metadata management and publication uh, workflow. And we have hope to to get our core trust seal uh, certification in 2021. Uh, I think that was everything I I wanted to say for today. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll happily answer. Thank you, Alina. Uh, this was very enlightening I, and, and I, I think reflects well the complexity of things. Also, I mean, uh, well, both the technology and the people and the change management there. So we do have a, a, a this is a, a question or comment uh, both uh, from Cindy in the chat uh so it's and it's about the uh, languages and how languages are handled and that we need tools that can toggle between languages or have exact the same information in all languages and then i guess this is also for for others so does anyone have experience using such modeling or implementations uh, that's a big question uh yeah <laughs> So I, I think that's something we need to keep and also th keep in mind when we are uh, thinking of the ETI next year and uh, projects. Uh, I will, I will, uh, there's another question. What tools are you using for your publication workflows? Uh, for the time, in fact, all the tools that are, I described are um, tools we use for our metadata publication. Our data uh, is available on um, the Ketle Project portal. Uh, they are, it's download, downloadable there. Uh, I, I don't know if it answered the, answers the question. Please just write a comment or raise your hand if you want to. Yes. And while we are, uh, uh, I, I can okay. think we can move to the next one. So uh, it should be easier. Which version of Dataverse did you use for migration? I see Genevieve answered because I had no idea. Okay, I knew yeah. something about 4.2. <laughs> so yeah, you have the answer in the chat. Yeah, yeah great. And then Francine has said, okay, thanks for the question. I Thank you. Uh, 
So thank you. That was very interesting. And I am sure we will get back to the language issues. That's also something that uh, SESTA uh, uh, is, needs to deal with. So, so this is certainly a discussion that needs to be ongoing. And we can also use, we can use the chat or, or the Discord uh, also today. Uh, but with that, I, I would like to move to our next presenter. Uh, the presentation will be is titled Question Driven Harmonization of Data, the Variable Cascade in Practice. So a nice follow up from previous presentations. And these presentations will be by John Johnson. Uh, John uh, is the technical lead at Closer, which has the aim of enhancing the documentation and discovery of UK social and population health longitudinal studies. He previously worked at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, where he was responsible for the data management of three UK birth cohort studies. And he has also worked at the UK Data Service. And I, I will add that John is also the co-chair of EDD 2020, for which uh, he deserves a big special thank you. So thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, John, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, can can is that can you see that? Sorry. I can see that and I can hear you. Yes. Good, good. Okay, so uh, th thanks, thanks, Marion. Um, to be honest, you're you're the other co-chair, so we could not have done it without uh, without you either. So thank you very much for all your efforts so far. Only one more day to go. Um, okay, so just, just so this just sort of follows on a bit um, from from. Partly what Jeremy was saying, there'll be actually be a couple of slides that uh, that Jeremy beat me to. So anyway, you have to watch those again, but I may put different words on them. Um, okay, well, let's have a go. So just a little bit about Closer. Closer is um, uh, started off with eight studies, and now we're um, we've grown to to have nineteen partners, um, and you know it's it's a it's a massive privilege really because you know we we were able to work with. Yeah, 90 years of longitudinal data and it's just a remarkable resource the UK's got and one of the things that Closer really is about is to is to make that legacy um, you know, fit for the 21st century and, 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 and hope to bring on new studies that, that get created hopefully meet the sort of standards that are set by by their predecessors. Um, so we at the moment have got 10 studies in Closer Discovery, which is our discovery portal. Um, and that that's, translates into nearly 400 data sets, 300 questionnaires, and a lot of questions and a lot of variables. And as Heidi said this morning, if you're on the questionnaire session, um, most of that was put in manually. Um, so it's been a bit of heroic effort. And so one of the things we wanted to do um, is to you know to use those questionnaires questions which have been painstakingly put in, and um, in terms of variable concordance or the variable cascade, this is something that I think allows us to start to manage the variables in a way that is is, is a bit more difficult for those studies which haven't got uh, questionnaires available. But I think it does uh, highlight why you know questions can be such a valuable part of any. Um, any portal or any discovery service or any documentation uh, and, and DDI lifecycle as Jeremy said introduced questionnaires in 2014 and you know within six years we're starting to really start to see the benefits of, of, of what, what it can deliver so here we go so this is the first slide that Jeremy <laughs> did as well uh, but so there's the variable cascade we've got the conceptual variable um, and the representative variable which is the the the, the with the sort of code lists, if you like, uh, and then the variable, which is the actual data itself. Now, it's a powerful way of thinking about data. And then in an ideal world, um, you'd have this information to hand. But I think as Jeremy said earlier, you know, that has to be quite often reconstructed back from the, uh, from the variables themselves, if you're going to do a uh, variable concordance. And uh, that, that is you know, quite a lot of lot of work and, and it's a lot of work within a single study and in you know within 10 studies it's 10 times a lot of work um, so you know we we ended up with the problem that looks like this if it feels like more so um, looking at it like this it looks a bit more a bit more scary 
um, particularly if we're having to do these sort of things <clears throat> manually, or we're trying to get the studies, which have already put enormous amounts of work already into into the project, to do to do to do this, and it's, it's on our it's on our watch to really try to make these processes as simple and as straightforward as we possibly can, and as accurate as we can, for the studies or for us to do them and for them to validate what we've done. So we really had to sort of think about this in a in a very different different way. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a different way of looking at thinking about the variable cascade. But it, you know, a, a question is basically a rarefaction of a topic or a concept, and it generates data. And <clears throat> adding the question into the into the mix, if you like, of the variable cascade, I think allows you to think about the problem in a slightly um, different different way um, so <clears throat> sorry this is a little bit complicated but so in the red box we've got the variable cascade as we've seen before and Jeremy explained very very well um, but we've also got in discovery and also just in the in the standard uh, these other things that that are related to the, the cascade and, the, and uh, itself and that is you know the question item so the question that was asked um, the, the actual question that was fielded into into it, that generated the data um, and then you've got the sort of underlying concepts where the questions came from and then you've got on top of that you've got sort of frameworks or ontologies like else or mesh and so and we're lucky in close in that we we were we put a lot of effort into making sure that all of our variables and all of our questions are uh, you know, tag to 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 an else store or mesh term, mostly else terms, um, and uh, the variables um, likewise. We've also got the relationship between each question, and each each variable, in there. Um, so that gives us a lot of information to play with. Um, so what we've done is, well, the thinking, the the the, the, the thought process was, was this. Um, so we've removed the represented variables, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, we've thrown away the, the fielded questions for the minute, so what the population was, no sort of flat bits of information. Um, but we still have the basic relationship between um, the conceptual variable, the instant variable, and the question still in place. It's sort of a bit like Jenga with DDI, I suppose. Um, and that that's our starting point. So, so, so I mentioned before, we're not we're not trying to use create represented variables in the same way, actually, as as, as I think probably um, what what NACTA are doing aren't either, um, and that's for several reasons. Because the, the aim of discovery is to provide enough information to allow researchers to make their own decisions, for instance, about harmonisation. So. There is a sort of danger for a sort of organisation like Closer to be making too many directional decisions for researchers. You should provide the information they need to make decisions about what they want to combine and how they want to to combine them. So um, we're not the study, so we don't own it in a sense. We have to sort of work with the studies to 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 come up with what they they want to represent. Um, and you know, it might be that some users find represented variables useful. For others, it might not be the case. Certainly, some of the discussions we've had with people who are doing a lot of harmonization work are a little bit, well, let me decide. Um, and probably, to be honest, the, the overwhelming reason is it's, it's a lot of work. And actually, just doing the conceptual variables will be enough to keep us busy for some considerable time. Um, so, our building blocks for this are. A collectible repository, which is all DDI lifecycle. We've got high-level topics, else or mesh. We've got the question information, the question name, the question text. We've got the, the code lists and stuff, but we don't necessarily need them for what we're doing here. The variable information, so we've got the variable name and the label. We've also got the code lists and that sort of stuff, multiplicity uh, information. We don't possibly don't need that at the moment. And then we've got the, the collector SDK, which allows us to manipulate the DDI items inside inside the repository, and I'm just going to show you some screens now about what the what the tool um, 
that we've developed um, looks like. <clears throat> so on the left, we've got the, the studies um, or series, depending on how your terminology in, in DDI. Um, and within that, there are, it's not what we've shown in this example, but there's the, the individual waves of, of data collection or the sweeps of data collection inside. We can select those inside an individual <clears throat> study. <clears throat> On the right hand side, we've got the options. So um, we can match on all or partial text in a question text or the question name. We can match on all or partial on partial text in a variable name or variable label. Um, we can also set up a sort of a, a string of, of, of words which we could use to, 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 to match. So we could just say, is this question exactly the same as this other question? Or can we say it's pretty close um, so these are our sort of first flush of, 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 of ways of thinking about trying to find the, 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 um, the commonalities between the question texts. And we've also got support for the variable labels and things, but generically variable labels are not um, a great way of, of searching, uh, comparing, or indeed, as Jeremy said, variable names, because those are very circumstantial sort of things. So we're mostly concentrating on, on, on the text of, of the question itself. <clears throat> so that allows us to sort of go through the, um, the study and pick out, you know, using these three terms in this, in this example, um, and to see whether the question texts are the same. So just on this first example, each row is effectively what will become a conceptual variable. Um, so in the green box, we've got you know, what the variable name that was linked to the to the questions, uh, and then on the right hand side, we've got which wave of data collection um, it took place in. Um, now, obviously, if you're using just a, str a, a string of car of uh, of, um, of words like at the in the bottom, the fourth the fourth one it says work at home, and that's picked up three questions which look pretty much the same. But when you have a look in the red box, it's picked up ones that are not quite the same. One's looking at the household earnings for a period of time. The other one's actually the amount. So you can select off with these tick boxes the ones you want to keep and the ones you don't want to, don't want to keep. So then that gives us um, a ability to start giving the conceptual variable a nice name and a nice description so that when it appears in in the repository it's got something that is you know decent now to start with it just copies over the existing names first name and first variable text it gets to give you to give you a sort of starting point so you edit that down to make something that's quite um, um, user friendly um, there's also a lot of other information in there about which item it is and the agencies and all this sort of thing. Sort of, it could be useful if you want to double check um, whether you know you generally are actually creating what is really a proper, you know, what could be considered um, a conceptual, what you consider to be a conceptual variable. Um, and so you can make decisions. Uh, if you realise here you've got something wrong, you can go back. It's all held in memory, so we try to so you can go back and forwards. In the in, in in the sort of application without having to lose any work that you've that you've done, um, and then once you've chosen, you know, given yourself a, a decent title and so on, you can then um, go to this screen, which basically is the format that Jeremy showed earlier for ingesting uh, conceptual variables into um, into the collectible repository. Um, so we've got the name and the description. We've got the topic um, that it's in, um, and then we've got the variables in the format that the collector wants it to be ingested in. Um, this second row is obviously wrong, but you can go back and change that if you wanted to. So from our perspective, this is, you know, a big step forward in being able to provide a 
you know a, a workbench if you like to be able to do um to do this sort of work without having to rely on you know, doing it all in spreadsheets and so on which is in some cases not ideal and the other thing of course is it will update as you add new information into into the repository because it's locked going live into the existing repository um, so this is what it looks like um, in the um, repository and you know, very similar to what Jeremy was showing on the other studies. Uh, this is actually some COVID data that we're about to release uh, for a couple of studies which have got longitudinal COVID data. And we're hoping to have about another four or five more studies with, with longitudinal COVID data in um, after a pretty short time after Christmas. Um, so again, here, this is a you know, very well behaved study, it's Unsound Society, it's a big long panel study. Um, you know, they've got the perfect variable namings, you know, uh, so that's, that's fantastic. So you could have used that, but you can't always rely on it. And as Jeremy said, you know, you, 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 can, you, you can create a better, um, using unique items rather than relying on variable names as a way of concording. Uh, and the next one is a good example where the study is not quite so well behaved in terms of variable naming. But the power of DDI is that it doesn't really matter what the variable is called because we found out that those things are comparable because they're using the same, the same or very, very similar questions. So in summary, um, so we've, we've basically trying to generate these things through matching criteria based on the actual question asked. Um, it's something that I hope will give us a bit of flexibility to make some human decisions where the matching criteria isn't isn't smart enough or is, is off for whatever reason. Um, it, it gives us the ability by extending the functionality of the of, of, of the search terms basically so we hand off to a more sophisticated matching algorithms for um, for questions so it's quite often questions are in, in, so, for instance, a similar question asked in a social science survey will be a more open-ended question. If it's asked in a medical survey, it will quite often be much more closed question. But it's asking exactly the same question. Um, so those things are quite difficult to do with the sort of rather sort of simple ways we're doing the matching at the moment. But there's, you know, there are some ways you can pass this sort of stuff off to, off to smart machine learning type things to go and tell you whether these things are semantically equivalent. Um, we could, we have got the capability to add code lists or other dimensions, population and respondent, which we already hold in, in the repository, if we wanted to finesse the decisions or to, to try to help to automate things a little bit more or exclude or include other things. Um, and the other thing is because we're doing this, you know, programmatically effectively, uh, we can capture the, the matching decisions um, that can then be added to a quality statement um so that when you looked at the the, the 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 comparability you know what the criteria were that that we that we decided it was a conceptual variable or or, or not as a case might be um finally massive thank you to bill norley who joined us literally as the covid thing started so i've actually never met him in uh, face to face but i'm looking forward to doing that uh, once the vaccine arrives um so bill's did almost did all the hard work in terms of the programming on that uh and to Haley for giving some really good feedback on 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 the front end um these are the things you can catch you can uh, contact us on and then you can say have a look at the closer.discovery discovery.closer.ac.uk if you want to go and see what we're up to in terms of what metadata we're holding let's be done great Thank you, John. Uh, uh, are there any questions to John? Any, any immediate questions? You can raise your hand or use the Q&A or chat. And while we are waiting for questions, I, I have one of my own. So, so John, can you say a few words about the future plans? So are you developing the tool further or, or uh, what are your plans? Uh, so it's it's been completed very, very recently. Um, and so we haven't really used it in anger. And I think the, um, yeah, so I think we'll want to use it in, in anger at first and see to, you know, knock some spots off it. But, you know, I think it has a lot of possibilities in terms of, you know, automation and stuff like that. And I think, 
you know, I think once once we've got, we, we've got a bit more experience using it and, and knowing its flaws and what work, you know, different different studies will need different strategies because they have different um, you know, conventions and some move from paper to cappy. So there's going to be lots of different issues that are going to start to arise. And I think once we get a bit of a better handle on what the, the real sort of problem is, um, then I think we will then look to find ways in which we can use computers to try to deal with it rather than chucking people at it. Mm. Yeah, and and uh, is all your metadata and documentation in English, or do you have uh, ah, do you have any multilinguality issues? It's all in English at the moment. Yes. No, oh, lucky you. Yeah, we have we have some we have some questionnaires in Welsh, but we actually haven't put them in yet. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we will we will get some things in in different languages. I think there's some we're getting we're putting in the census, um, and there is Irish and Bel Welsh versions and the Gaelic version. I think of that, um, but I'm avoiding that one at the moment. Thank you. I, uh, this is also I, I think a question for Jeremy. If uh, I think you are still here, so so have you dealt with multilingual uh, data documentation? Uh, when using Collectica? Yeah, definitely. Um, so DDI Lifecycle supports that, of course, which is good. And so our tools do as well. Um, so the main examples I can think of are like INSEE, of course, does things in French and English and NSD, who we've been working with more recently, um, is doing both Norwegian and English. Uh, but yeah, we've been doing that since the beginning, the multiple languages. Mm, great. Uh, and I, I can see there's a the discussion. Hopefully, uh, we'll be starting on on the Discord channel about multilinguality and also other issues. Um, I'm looking. Yeah, there's a there's a question. Uh, so, will you be adding the common conceptual variables across the studies, similar to how it, Jeremy showed? So that's for you, John. Uh, yes, we certainly hope to. Um, I think the I mean, one one of the reasons we've done this software is because it, we've got a lot of stuff. Um, so I think we'd have to work out, you know, what are the sort of parameters we need to be capturing and, and how we can do that. And I think we would like to quite like to work with the, the NACT a lot anyway, because we've got very, very similar problems. Um, and it'd be good to try to do some joint work with them to, you know, bear down on these sort of, sort of, they, they look very similar, but once you, once you get actually down to the data, they, they throw up very different problems in terms. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Seems all the 70 persons in the, in the webinar are pretty silent at the moment, uh, but that's fine. That's you are, you are allowed to be silent. Uh, but this, I mean, this then means we will con conclude uh, our session today. Thank you, a big thank you for all the presenters and, and for Juliana for the technical support. And, and thank you all for attending. Uh, see you again tomorrow and have a nice 